Amen. We are continuing our series talking about faith. Alex, we're going to have enough. All right. If not, carry the originals in the office there. As we've started off each time with Luke chapter 17, and the apostle said unto the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if ye had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. First week we talked about compatibility as it's pertains to faith. The second week we talked about trust. And these are all, these are all, as I look at this and and review this, I, I see such a comparison to just relationships, right? And that's really, that's really what faith is. I hope that I hope that that has kind of come to the surface during this. That ah, uh, faith isn't this <laughs> spiritual blob. That oh, if I just had some of this, then 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 everything would be okay. Then then I could see the miraculous. What I hope you are seeing through this study is that faith has a lot to do with relationship with God. And so first we have to understand that we are not compatible with God without grace, and we access that grace by faith. So understanding that there's a compatibility issue, just like a relationship, right? There are two people... Uh, coming together, maybe as newlyweds or even as friends, people in church. Uh, sometimes we aren't the most compatible. Um, but what do we need? We need, uh, we need love. We need patience. We need those things. And so how do we, uh, how, do, how is our relationship with God since sin has caused a compatibility issue? Well, thank God for his grace. And then we access it by faith. And then the second week we talked about trust. Again, with any relationship, if you don't have trust, the relationship is only going to go so far. Then the third week we talked about obedience because he's a perfect God. And, well, we need to be obedient to him because that's what he's asked us to do. Last week we talked about integrity. Tonight, I want to talk to you, as we, as we discuss faith, I want to talk to you about laboring for the kingdom, or if I could say it a different way, ministry. This is going to be about ministry tonight. Luke chapter 22 and verse 31, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold. Did you ever wonder, what did Jesus see? You know, what did he see? Ah, That blows my mind. But he just kind of comes up to him and says, Hey, Simon, Satan, Satan's been asking for you. Satan wants to, he's desired to have you, Simon. I mean, did Simon know this? Did he know what was going on? Did he feel maybe something different going on? And all of a sudden, Jesus just opens his eyes and said, Look, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But Simon, I prayed for you that thy faith fail not. And we talk about this and we, we've discussed this. And, uh, and we usually stop there. At least I often do. But I want to focus on this part of the, that verse. And when, hey Simon, you're going to make it. Simon, I prayed for you. You're going to make it, Simon. And when you're converted, when you make it, Simon, when you come through on the other side of this, 
strengthen thy brethren. I prayed for you that your faith won't fail. That's what Jesus was praying for. Uh, no, I'm not praying that you'll be comfortable, Simon. I'm not praying that you won't get some bumps and bruises. That's not what I'm praying for. I'm praying that your faith doesn't fail. And when you're converted, when you make it, here's what I want you to do. Strengthen your brother. Help somebody else because there's somebody else that's going to be going through that trial and that test. We've used this representation of a mustard seed. And tonight I want to go through that a little bit more. Matthew 17 and verse 14. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's a lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And he says this, and I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Okay. Then came the Jesus apart. <laughs> Later on, as they were walking back to camp or, or wherever they were headed to, then they said, why couldn't we do it? I mean, we were down there. We, 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 had, our, we had our hand on his head. We were using anointing oil. We were doing it the same way you did it. We prayed in your name. Jesus, how come we couldn't do it? And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain. And then we, we read this scripture removed. Hence to yonder place it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. And he goes on to say in verse 21, Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. But let me draw your attention back to verse 20. He says, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed. He didn't, he didn't necessarily say that. Uh, it was, he wasn't just referring to the size. He wasn't just saying, well, if you even have faith this size, you'll be okay. He said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, if you, really what he's saying, if you'll just have faith, if you'll just have something, it doesn't matter. I think sometimes we talk about how much faith we have when really, Jesus is saying, if you just take what you have, if you just take what we have, you should expect results. Because the next scripture that I have on your sheet of paper, Matthew 13 and 31, he, he talks about this in a different parable. He talks about this mustard seed. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of, here it is again, a mustard seed, which a man took and he sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. So now let's, let's put these two together. Let's, let's, let's combine both of these stories that Jesus talked about as, uh, about these mustard seeds. His point is this. Our faith should produce results. Our faith, no matter what you think of your faith, no matter if you feel like it's, it's big, it's small, your faith should produce results. It should grow and mature. And I think sometimes we, we, we think that faith is, is kind of a, uh, an instantaneous uh, commodity or, or something that, you know, if, I, if we come out of a fast... Or if I pray for a long time, then I have a lot of faith. Then let me go lay hands on the sick and, and then let me go witness or, or 
But what he's saying is, look, this, this faith that you have, it takes time to grow and mature. I mean, look, at that, look at that scripture again. When it is grown, your faith, when it is grown, then it's the greatest. And, and then what happens? Then it becometh a tree. And, and so, that, so that it's like just for, for uh, you know, to look at? No, so that birds of the air can come and lodge thereof. But you don't see birds come and lodge in a, in a seed, right? They might come and eat it. But that, that, that doesn't do a bird any good. That doesn't really help anybody. Even a bird probably doesn't get a whole lot out of just a single seed. But if that seed is, is put in the ground and it's, it's given time to grow and mature, then it's able to grow into something that is useful and can minister and help others. So our faith, our faith, that seed needs to go through a process really what I'm trying to communicate to you tonight. The first step is that seed needs to be planted in the ground. What happens there? It dies. Right? John 12 and 24. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. That seed it needs to be planted. It needs to be buried. It needs to be taken out from what it was comfortable in. And it needs to be taken away from its life source. And it needs to die. And that's what we need to do. If our faith is to grow into something that can minister to others and can actually help. Let me just, I'm trying to feel like I'm trudging through some mud here. Trying to connect these dots. Jesus prayed for Peter. Not for him just to make it. Not for him just to, just to be okay. We want to be okay. God, help me with this trial. God, I, I help heal my body and, and help me so I don't feel this way and, and lift this burden off of me. And, and Jesus is saying, oh, okay, I'll do that. But what I really want is I want your faith to stay strong so that when you make it through this process and when you make it through this trial, then you're going to be able to minister to others. If I take you out right now, if I, if I just answer your prayer and just remove you from this situation, then, well, then you feel better, but you're not useful. I, I can't use you to minister like I want you to minister. Peter, you need to go through this. Peter, you, you need to go through this trial. The devil's trying to sift you. That, but I'm, I'm praying for you, and, and you're going to make it. And, 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 and Jesus is that advocate. Jesus is the intercessor. Jesus is still praying for us, and he's still on our side. And if he's still praying for us, then we are going to make it. We can have that same assurance. But there's a purpose in what you're going through. Your faith is, is being strengthened. Your, your faith is, is growing so that it can minister and, and help others. But first... Our faith being that seed, all right, so that, that, that faith, our faith is that mustard seed. The first thing that needs to happen is that faith needs to die. Self needs to die. I've got to be put into the ground. I've got to be buried. I've got to die out to myself. Unless that, unless that corn, unless that seed falls into the ground and dies, it, it's alone. But if it dies, if you die out to yourself, if you will say, God, plant me, plant me in the waters of baptism, plant me at the altar. The altar is a place of death. Old Testament altar, that's where they sacrificed the animals. That's where, that's where, they, were, that's where they were killed. At the altar, and so we come to the altar to die out to myself. 
Because you cannot be useful unless you die out to yourself, unless you die out to your flesh, you die out to your desires. God can't use you. And, and, and that's the end game. That's the purpose is to be a to minister and to help others and, and to strengthen our brethren. And that's what God wants to do, but he has to take us through this process of, of dying out. Verse 25 of John 12, he that loveth his life shall lose it. You can love your life, this, this whole, your, your whole life on earth. If you're, if you're going to love your life and, and do what pleases you, you're going to have your joy during this life. But at the end of it, you're going to lose it. At the end of it, it's just going to be like, I just, I imagine God saying, well, you had your fun. There you go. You lived your life for you. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, you're going to lose it. The scripture goes on that he that hateth his life, and certainly we're not meant to just hate, hate ourselves or hate others, but hate our life in, in, in such a, in a way that God, I love you more than everything else. I love you, God, so much that in comparison, I hate everything else. Right? Jesus said you need to hate your father, your mother, your children. He doesn't want, he doesn't want us to literally hate them. But in comparison to our love towards him, everything else just doesn't matter. And so if we, if we hate our life like that, then you know what? If we hate it in this world, then we're going to keep it unto life eternal. Hate, your, hate, hate the things of this world. In comparison to God, nothing else is more important. If you do that, then you're going to gain life eternal. So we need to die out. But it can't be just any ground that we die out. It needs to be good ground. There's a parable about this in Matthew chapter 13. He said there was some seed that was sown on the wayside. That's not good ground. It was easily plucked away. The enemy, the enemy stole that seed. Good ground isn't just emotion. It's not just being sorry. And that's why I'm coming to church and Good ground is saying, you know what, yeah, I'm going through some things right now, but I really just want to get closer to God. Good ground allows this word to take root. You ever have just something tender that is growing up out of the ground? It, it's so easy to, to, to pluck out, isn't it? Uh, whether it's a plant or a weed, it really doesn't matter when it's so, so, so tender, and that's how our faith is. Someone just coming into the faith, it's, it's very easy to pluck out, and the enemy knows that. Trials and tribulations try to uproot our faith. Good ground is not among thorns. The thorns are the cares of this world and deceitfulness of, deceitfulness of riches. Those, those, that would choke your faith. If, you, if you're concerned about this world, if you're concerned about money, if you're concerned about happiness, then you know what? That, that's going to choke your faith. Your, your, your faith isn't going to be able to survive that. But Matthew 13 and 23 says this, but he that received the word into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it. It's not just emotion. It's not just celebration. You've got to understand what the word of God says, and then you're going to bear fruit. That's the purpose. And you're going to bring forth some 100, some 60, some 30. So in time, this tiny faith, this seed, it begins to grow. How does it grow? It grows under the surface. Nobody can see it. That's how faith grows. I can't, I can't see it. Brothers and sisters can't see it. God sees what's happening. God sees what's happening under, underneath the surface when you've died out and you've been planted. And all of a sudden, something that was dead all of a sudden begins to to sprout and to break open and, and something new comes out of it. See, that's, 
I scared some of you before when I said you had to die out. And, and, and what does that mean? Well, you know what? When you die out to God, that's not the end. Something is going to come out every time that you die out to God. God is going to bring life from that, just like that seed that is planted in the ground. Someone says, well, that was a waste. That was a waste. You just wasted good seed there. What, and how many of us have had family members that have looked? Well, that was a waste of a life. Send you to college and get an engineering degree just so you can become a pastor? That was a waste. Well, I took that and I put it on the altar. The God that you take this isn't mine. Might have been more comfortable, might have been some other perks from it. I said, God. I put it on the altar. Take it. I didn't lose a thing. Don't regret it. Why? Because God brought life from it. That was planted in the ground. That was buried. Well, there was something that, that came from that. There was a sprout that nobody saw it, at least not right away. Sometimes it takes some time. That's what happens with a seed. But it begins to grow. It's watered by the word of God, by, by that relationship with him, that, that prayer and fasting. That's how, that, that's how you just connect with him, and it continues to grow until it breaks through the ground. And then what happens? Then we come into our main reason for, for our faith, and that's ministry. That seed is not just meant to grow up and be something good to look at. Yeah, again, I'm... I'm I'm walking through a progression here, and, and you've got to die out to yourself, and, and then you've got to go through that time where nobody else sees what's going on. You've got to go through that time where, where God is doing something, and you're, you're, feeling, you're feeling changes. You're, you're, you're feeling things going on, but nobody else sees it. Everybody else just thinks that your life is a waste, and, and then all of a sudden it breaks through the ground, and finally it's like, whoo. You know, I'm done with that stage, and now there, you begin to see some growth. And but you know what? We can, if we're not careful, we can get stuck there, because we grow up and we can grow into something beautiful and and something that's no longer dead and in the ground, and we can stop there. Well, that's not that's not just what God wants. God wants you and me to bear fruit. God wants there to be a purpose in our life. He doesn't just want you. To just sit there and look pretty. That's not, not God's purpose. That, that, you know, you got to think, you know, we have quick trips and McDonald's and, you know, you can get on, your, get on the road and stop and get some food, gas up, you know, get something to drink. You got to think in ancient days, you know, you can only pack so much, and, and, and you're talking a whole different environment. And, and for them, a tree was a big deal. For them, a tree was a place to stop and to rest. A, a, a tree was a place where, where, where you could escape the, 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 the heat of the sun. A tree was a place where maybe you could get some fruit, some nourishment. I mean, the, the tree was like the quick trip of Jesus' day. <laughs> That was a place for you to stop and, you know, get refreshed. A tree was very useful. It, it, it bore fruit. It helped others. And that's what Jesus wants to have happen with our faith. Amen? It's meant to be a service to others. I remember growing up and going out into the cornfields with my dad and I remember, I remember going out and, 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 and coming up to a field, and it, it looked, we had done everything that needed to be done. Prepared the ground, plowed the field, dissed the field, you know, got it all ready, planted the seed, you know, paid good money for the seed, planted it, uh, seed came up. Uh, you, you know, you weeded it, you, you, you did all this to, 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 to bring, to bring a, a, a crop of corn. 
And it was going good, right? Knee high by the 4th of July. You're checking the corn. It's looking good. I remember going out one time to the field and seeing the field shredded. You ever see Brother Dennis, probably some others have seen, seen, a, seen a field, cornfield once it's been hit by hail? Just shredded. All that, all that work. All that, all that time, all that money, all that effort. And here, one storm shredded the field, just decimated it, ruined the crop. Ever been there? Well, maybe there was crop insurance, or maybe you could, you know, chop that up for feed. But in God's kingdom, there is no insurance policy. Anyone ever done all the, all the right things? Prayed for the person, invited the person to church, hung out with them, spent time with them. just to have them walk away, taught them a Bible study, thought you made a connection, all of a sudden they just leave. Like, why? It feels like that crop that, 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 that you, you, you put a lot of time and effort into and all of a sudden it's just gone. Some would call it a spiritual miscarriage. It's painful. And then we often ask, what? What went wrong? Something had to go wrong. Did I say the wrong thing? Did, did so-and-so from church talk to them? Did so-and-so from the community, did their family get to them? And, and we try to think, what, what is it that went wrong? We don't know. Can I tell somebody today? The results of your faith are not up to you. We are not to compare or gauge our Results. Abraham. You talk about Abraham, you're talking about a man of faith. He never saw his descendants as the stars in the heaven or the sand on the sea. He never saw that city that he, he wanted to see so bad. He never got to see the results of his faith. But he was faithful. He was faithful. So let's take a look at the life of Paul. There's a number of scriptures there, and I didn't want to. I have them there for you to look at, but I, I'm guessing many of these you'll recognize. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Paul, what did you do? Wow, what a ministry Paul had. Paul said, not really. Not really. All I did was plant. All I did was plant seeds. Somebody else came by later on and watered, but you know what? God gave the increase. See, you cannot always, can't always, I would say you should, you should be very careful how you measure your faith. You should be very careful how you measure your spiritual walk. Don't compare it to somebody else. Don't compare it to, really, to anything. It's before God, and you, we rarely, could I say, rarely get to see the effects of our faith and and he rarely get to see the effects of our prayers and our fasting and, and just being faithful. We, that is not a guarantee that we're able to see the results of that. Paul said, look, all I did was I planted. I planted seeds. I, I, look, I, I didn't even stick around to see what happened. Paul was planting seeds and going on to the next city and leaving it to God and leaving it to his 
fellow brethren, somebody else to water, but God to give the increase. He said, so then neither is he that planted anything, neither he that watereth, but the only one who gets the glory is the only one who does the miraculous, and that's God, because God gives the increase. He said, now he that planteth and he that watereth, they're one. They're one. It really doesn't matter. Oh, you, you, this is your ministry, and that's your ministry. You just, you just do what God's called you to do. Do something. You got to be doing something in the kingdom. If you're just sitting there, then you are a, a fruitless tree. You're just, you're just there, there to look good. You're not doing anything. That's not what God wants. God would rather have an ugly tree that bears some fruit, right? He cursed the good-looking tree that didn't bear any fruit. Paul said, he that watereth, he that planteth, they're one. Every man shall receive his own reward according to what? His own labor. So I'm talking about tonight. Your faith is also laboring. It's also ministry. You're going to receive a reward based on your labor. Is that works? Yep, that works. <laughs> Thing is, you can't do it. God is the only one who can do it, but you got to do something. For we are laborers together with God. We are God's husbandry. And we are God's building. Sometimes we feel like serving God should be glamorous. 2 Corinthians 11 and 23, are they ministers of Christ? Paul says, I speak as a fool. I'm more in labors, here it is again, in labors more abundant. Paul wasn't afraid to say, yeah, I, I, I've worked for the kingdom of God. He wasn't bragging. He was, he was just telling it the way it was. Yeah, I, in labors, I, I'm more abundant. And stripes, and what does he compare that with? Well, how does, how does ministry, what does ministry look like, pastor? Is it, wow, that must be really, really nice to be able to get up and, and, uh, and, and preach and, and do this and do that. Here's, here's how Paul describes ministry and laboring. In labor is more abundant. In stripes, beatings, above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save once. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwrecks. This is ministry. This is serving. This is, I'm not just talking about uh, pastor. I'm, all of us are ministers. All of us are laborers. All of us need to be doing something in the kingdom, and it isn't easy, and it isn't glamorous. A night and a day I have been in the deep, and journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. That was Paul's life. That was ministry. That was serving. That was being faithful. But with maturity, we will learn that our faith does not depend on our situation because Paul also says this in Philippians 4 and 11, not that I speak in respect of want. For I have learned. How did you get it, Paul? How did you get there? Was it just a gift from God? Was it something that you read in the Torah? Was it someone from a teaching? No, he says, for I have learned. It takes some time. It takes some learning. What did you learn, Paul? I've learned that whenever and whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Some of us still haven't learned that. Some of us haven't learned that. And it's a reflection of your faith. Your faith, what were we talking about? Your ups and downs, right? Life, life is ups and downs. And if, and if you don't have the ups and downs, how do you, well, how do you say it? How do you appreciate the ups if you don't go through the downs? Right? Life is ups and downs. That, there, there's no stopping the roller coaster of life. I'm sorry. But that doesn't mean that your faith should be there and be gone. No, you've got to stay faithful. You've got to remain, Paul says, content. No matter what I'm in. Are you happy? No, I ain't happy. Been shipwrecked, been beaten. He's not happy, but he's content. 
And that's what we need to learn. That's, that, that, that's, the, that's the lesson of being faithful. That's the lesson of, of not being a, a flash in the pan type faith, but a, a faith that is more reflective of a seed that, that is planted and then goes through a process of time. He says, no matter what, I'm going to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. I know how to be up. I know how to be down. Everywhere and in all things, I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And then in, in one of probably the verses that is most, most taken out of context, at the end of all that, then Paul says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. Like, we like the picture of the, the runner, you know, who's, who's running the marathon. I can do all things <laughs> through Christ which strengthened me. And we think, well, yeah, that verse, I can do all things. And absolutely, I've used that verse in that context. I'm not saying it's wrong. But if you look at the context that it, that it was actually given to us, he wasn't saying, well, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me to, to be content. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me to be content in no matter what situation I'm in. Whether you've just lost a loved one, whether you're sick, whether you've gotten a, a diagnosis from the doctor, whether the marriage is failing, whether the job has run out, whether the finances are not there, then I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I can be content even in those situations. That's faith. Let me close with this, 2 Timothy 4. Many say, and I believe this is the last, the last letter that Paul wrote to his Young minister friend Timothy, this is such a personal letter. Paul knows he's at the end of his life, and, and so it's a very personal letter. And he, he says in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 6, he says, I'm now ready. Wow. How many, how many want to be able to say that? You know, we, we should be able to say that. I'm ready. Uh, not, that, not that I want to die. Not that I hope to die. But can you honestly say tonight, I'm, I'm ready? Paul was able to say that. I'm, he says, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. He knew it. And he says this, I have fought a good fight. Was it perfect? No, it wasn't perfect. Did you make mistakes? Yes. But, but, I've, but I've fought a good fight. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. Here it is. I have kept the faith. This is how Paul was able to say, Timothy, young man, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to be offered. I, I haven't done it perfectly, but I, I fought the fight. I've I finished my course, and you know what else? Through it all, through the ups and the downs, through the, through the trials, through the hard times, I've kept the faith. Henceforth, here we are. If you keep the faith, if you run the race, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only. He said, look, look, look. It isn't just because I'm Paul. It isn't just because I, I've been called to be an apostle. He says, it's not just to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Do you look forward to his appearing? Do you look forward to the time when Jesus is going to come through the clouds? If you look forward to that, if you've kept the faith, if you've allowed God to, to, to bring a harvest, to bring an increase, if you've done that, then you can claim and grab onto those same words that Paul 
wrote Timothy in 2 Timothy, there's going to be a crown one day at his appearing. Amen. I think it's okay for us just to clap our hands unto the Lord. Amen. Are you, look forward? Are you looking forward to his appearing? Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. All right, any, any questions, any comments? Mr. Abigail? Amen, good. God is good. Keep the faith. Keep the faith. There's a purpose for it. Brother Alberto? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's I think that's wise. Um, wise to to work together and and to um, yeah, I think I think that's that's wise to do that. Absolutely. Anybody else? Amen. Amen. It's by His grace, right? He, he is the one who gives us the, the strength and the power to do it. And that's why He gets all the glory. Amen. There, there's such, there's such a, a, a tension or just kind of a... People want to tell us, and that, that's really what I felt with this conversation about faith, um, that there's, there's a lie out there that says that you, we don't do anything. Oh, it's just the, the grace of God does, does everything, but that's, that's, that's a lie. There, we have a response. We need to respond to the grace of God. You need to do something. And, and again, the, 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 the issue is you don't, put, you don't put faith in your works. You don't put faith in what you do. That, that's, yeah, that's an issue. Yeah, oh, I did this, and I did that, and it was me, me, me. No, no, the glory goes to God, and God's the one who does it, but he's, through all time, he's, he's, he partners with mankind, and so we need to do something, and, and that's, that's faith. faith. Faith requires action. Brother George? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Right. Yes, amen. Yeah, unless we, unless we become like that child, right? Having that, yeah, doubt. Doubt is certainly the, the enemy of faith, and uh, but but again, I, I and I, I I'll, I've been guilty of this. I feel like I, I need to get into a, a a state of mind, right? Someone needs a Holy Ghost. Well, let me let me get in the zone, you know. Let me oh, someone's coming up for for prayer, and this is this is a biggie, like oh, you know, and you feel like you need to, you know, have that faith. Or let me get into that child life. I, I need to believe. And, and, and really, it's about how you've lived your life. What <laughs> When you come up for prayer, you know, that's not the time for me to say, give me a second so I can go pray <laughs> before I pray for you. No, that, that, that happened earlier today. That happened in the morning. That, and that's our relationship. That's... That that is that is the process of just living with God and 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 having that relationship with Him. So when it comes time, when someone needs 
Your faith needs prayer. You're ready. Like the tree doesn't have to say, well, give me a little bit. Oh, now you need fruit. No, the, 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 the tree has been through the process. And when the time is right, the, the, the fruit is there. And, and God knows all that. And so, yeah, it's more just that, just that process of, of being in the presence of God and, and praying often. You know, pray without ceasing so that when that time comes, when God needs to use you to strengthen your brother and to strengthen somebody, you're ready. You're ready. Just you're ready. You don't need, I, I don't want to make light of, hear me, I'm not making light of prayer. Like, but when somebody says they need something, that's not the time to pray. Like, that's the time to do it. They need it now. You should have already prayed. You should already be in the presence of God and, and hear the voice of God so that you can be used by him. Amen. Yes, Mr. Cohen? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so true. Yeah. Yeah, you, I, my mind just goes back to Brother, Brother and Sister Hanscom who were here, you know, a few months ago. And, you know, the man of faith, he used in, in the miraculous. And, and then you read his book <laughs> and you realize why. Uh, the man was through, the man uh, lost his son. You know, his son was raised from the dead. Um, you understand where, what that man was through and, and why was his faith at that level? Was it because, you know, uh, consecration to God because he, he fasted, you know, three days before he came here? Maybe he did. But that faith came from that, those years of being through those trials so that he, he, he's, he, he knows God. He's seen God. He's seen God work. He has that, that faith as a child. And I think God, wants, God does not waste trials. If you're going through a trial, God is not wasting that. God wants to use that to, to build your faith. When you come out on the other side of that, uh, you're going to be a stronger Christian, and you're going to be able to be used by him even more. Amen. One more question, Brother Alberto. Mm-hmm. Yes, all we can do is plant those seeds. Amen. Plant seeds. We, maybe it gets thrown back at us. Maybe we, we say, oh, that's a waste, but nothing is a waste. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love and thank you. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for being so faithful to us. We thank you for giving us the strength to make it another day. And God, it is such a high mark to, to attain to. We're such a, such a high mark, Lord, but we know that your grace is there to keep us and to protect us. And I pray right now you're covering over, over the church, over everyone in this place, Lord, that we could walk out of here stronger, that we could walk out of here with a greater faith, and that, Lord, that there would be a purpose for that faith, and that would be so that we could strengthen, bless, minister, and labor in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you tonight. If you're able to stick around, help get things ready for a mile. I appreciate it. Otherwise, God bless you.